T minus 10, 9, 8. We have a go for main engine start. We have main engine start. 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. 30 feet, two and a half down, straight shadow, four forward, four forward, drift into the right a little, down a half. 30 seconds. We copy you down, Eagle. Listen, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twin Tranquility. We copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. My husband was at work, and I was home taking care of my first baby, who was eight days old. We were in the living room of our house in Villa Park, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. I had gone to uh, Lima, Peru on a business deal with my dad. The day of the, of the landing, I was at a friend's house and we were all together watching in front of the TV. My kids, they were little, like three and four and 13, and they even paid attention. I was. Uh, Pretty young, about four years old, but it was such a big deal. Apollo 11 was such a big deal. The moon landing was, uh, there's only two times in my life that I can remember my mom letting me stay up late. That time I was working for Brinks on the south side of Chicago. I got so tired of waiting for Neil Armstrong to come out that I went to bed early and I didn't see that first step. I had a good friend in Indianapolis, Dave, he invited several people over to his apartment for a big cookout and watch the moon landing. I was only nine months old when that happened, so I don't really have any memory of it. But my, my dad tells me that, yeah, they, my, he and my mother did watch it on TV. It certainly uh, fits quite awkwardly in with the, the late 1960s, you know, and, and the, the, the political tumult, the assassinations, the Vietnam War, the Black Power Movement. All of that is going on in the late 1960s. And then you've got this episode where uh, these three Americans who are at least on the surface kind of, you know, white male conservatives. Uh, and uh, then you've got Armstrong in particular, Aldrin and, uh, and Collins, you know, uh, who are, you know, sort of the right stuff. They become these tremendous heroes. There's a ticker tape parade for them in New York City where, you know, hundreds of thousands of people greet them. Uh, so I do think maybe a shot in the arm. Certainly President Nixon wanted to sort of use it as a shot in the arm and try to inspire a, a renewed sense of patriotism. You know, at the same time, 1969, we also have that other Im embittered battle going on in Vietnam. So you have, you know, on the one side, you're so proud of what your country could do. And on the other side, you had this whole other issue taking place. I mean, the summer of 69, and of course, there's a song with that title. I mean, this was, this was an interesting, interesting time uh, to be part of our culture and part of our country. And I remember the argument being, well, you know, for the cost of sending somebody to the moon, we could feed all these people. That argument is around still today, and we still, there are still hungry people. We still haven't solved, solved that problem. There was just so many issues going on and, and so much tension bubbling to, bubbling to the surface. I felt that this was such an, an advancement for us as a country because there had been some negative press. There's always negative press and there was a, a lot of things going on that were uh, controversial. So I felt that this was a time that we shined as a country that could unite because everybody watched that could, I'm sure. It wasn't just limited to us. 
that walk was seen by a lot of people. That landing was seen by a lot of people. We were five or six when the Mercury program took, started taking off. I remember getting up at ridiculously early moment uh, in the morning for a six-year-old to watch, sit there and watch a Mercury rocket take off from Cape Canaveral at the time. And back then, they, there were all these delays. So you could be watching a stupid rocket on the launch pad for an hour and a half in a delay, T minus 15 minutes and holding. At that time, most of my teachers were probably World War II vets. You know, they had some military expen uh, experience. So the whole moon thing was, it was uh, lots of national pride. From my recollection, uh, that, that science was very, very much nurtured at this time. And you'd have a lot of examples in school. You know, of course, uh, at 15, I was, you know, ending junior high and going into high school. And there was a lot of interest in just not only space, but technology, innovation, creation of, of new products and things like that. And that, that made it an imprint on a lot of us at that time, at least myself and, and several of my friends. When you're asking how did uh, mankind change, uh, I think it's interesting, uh, my grandparents, uh, in their lifetime, what they saw. Um, they were small children when the age of flight began, and they were close to the end of their life when we walked on the moon. Uh, my viewpoint as a, a nine-year-old or an eight-year-old boy was, is that looking back now from my 57 years, I think of what that has done to our culture. You know, everybody has a computer on their desk, at least one. Um, every home, I bet, probably has an average of three to four computers. And at that time, all you had were these super computers. And, uh, you know, if you would have told somebody that in a short uh, 25, 30 years that computers would be such a part of our life, it'd be hard to uh, imagine that. Now, this is Cold War time. And uh, as, a, as a Cold War kid, uh, you know, I remember going on the bus, uh, the public bus, and there'd be signs, you know, placards, uh, and the one that's so memorable to me, and, and I'll never forget it, you know, was a picture of Khrushchev with his finger pointing at you, you know, saying, we will bury you. I mean, that, I mean, that propaganda was out there, and of course, as a, as a 13, 14, 15-year-old kid, you're seeing this, I mean, it had an impression. So this was, this was like winning the war, you know, to get there and to be the first to land somebody on the moon. It, it, it was huge. Remember that in 1957, you've got Sputnik, and this causes alarm across the country. Uh, Edward Teller, who was one of the, the great American uh, atomic scientists, uh, described Sputnik as a, uh, a technological Pearl Harbor. So it upset people to that degree, and it inspired a great deal of spending, a great deal of soul searching, uh, a great deal of concern about the American character, right? What's wrong with Americans? Well, you know, uh, we spend too much time in front of the TV. Our schools aren't tough enough. Uh, we're, we're, you know, our, life's, our, our life is too easy. Oh, the Russians. Sputnik sent a uh, fire under us to well, do something. Well, that's true. Yeah. I mean, you know, that yeah. was very... And, and so I, I think politically it was a big deal. I remember the duck and cover routines. I remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. I remember... Uh, the look on my mother's face uh, when that was going down. We did not have a bomb shelter, but we certainly thought about, you know, moving stuff down into our crawl space. We would have been dead, you know, living 20 miles from Chicago. And I do remember, by the way, seeing Sputnik, which was the beginning of it all, a little pier and then gone, a little dot going across. And uh, that I remember from standing out on the back porch of our three-store floor apartment building. I think about people sitting there going and watching Sputnik fly by and how an such an alien concept and how, how insulting that must have, that it was to them. And the fact that the Russians you know, sent the first dog to space and had the first woman-ass cosmonaut and had 
people orbiting them. I mean, the John Glenn orbit was such a big deal for America, but the Russians had already done it. You know, they were ahead of us in so many different ways until just our sheer volume of effort caught and passed up. What I do remember is that my mom thinking that it was a, a wonderful thing. And then um, the lady across the street who was the closest thing to a grandmother I ever knew thought it was a big hoax. You know, that there, you know, that it was just, it was a way for us to get back at the Russians because the Russians were beating us in the space race at that time. And she thought it was all bunkum, you know. There was some serious questions of whether or not they would beat us to the moon. And if had they beaten us to the moon, I'm not sure we would have gone to the moon. Uh, you know, I don't know. In the 60s, the moon missions captured the public imagination. And there was no better spokesman for it than Kennedy when he de declared the mission that we will get to the moon before the end of the decade. He declared this at the beginning of that decade. I also recall President John F. Kennedy's 1961 inaugural address when he said, in this decade, man will go to the moon. But unfortunately, as you know, he never lived to see that day. Initially, I think it was sort of, you know, a statement that went along with the notion of American credibility. We are powerful, we are credible, we can keep our word. So that's a message being sent out, as Kennedy would put it, to friends and foes alike. What JFK said, he said he was going to put a man on the moon, and we did. We went. You know, man, man can do whatever he dreams, you can do. I remember after President Kennedy was assassinated in 1963 that, oh boy, you know, there goes all the funding, there goes all the planning and stuff. But it picked up. It really did. People that were in NASA at the time, they kind of felt, you know, this was a challenge now. We've got to do that. Johnson was there in the Senate and was instrumental, not that Kennedy wasn't there in the Senate as well in 1950, uh, 1958 when they started NASA, uh, but it was really the Senate Majority Leader Johnson who was able to shepherd that bill through, and he really looked at NASA kind of as his own baby, uh, and he didn't mind pushing for it, he didn't mind spending a lot of money in general, but he certainly didn't mind spending a lot of money on NASA. Remember that he's there for the failure in 1967 of Apollo 1. Uh, now, you know, you could have pulled the plug right there, because that's a terrible disaster and you've lost three lives, but they just push right on. Uh, and, uh, you know, a, a, a real testament to Johnson's will and the will of uh, the astronauts and uh, NASA in general. Nixon called the astronauts while they were on the moon and congratulated them. Uh, Nixon's speechwriter, I guess, had a speech prepared in case they failed and died on the moon or died in each place in the process. But Nixon, from what I understand, was, was not a fan of the space program, was upset that uh, Kennedy was getting a lot of this credit NASA struggled, struggled to find something, a mission to continue on after, because I do think Nixon and the, the, uh, his administration started cutting the funding for NASA shortly after Apollo 11. The Cold War in 1969 wasn't exactly what it was in 1948, uh, or 1961 for that matter, when Kennedy stood before Congress and declared, you know, we're going to put a man on the moon. Um, by 1969, you've got detente. Uh, Nixon's big problems were kind of what other people would have considered small problems, although they had small problems that had become big problems. Uh, you know, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, uh, the North Vietnamese, uh, all of these smaller problems that had kind of boiled up. Uh, Nixon, by 69, was moving toward reconciliation with the People's Republic of China. He's not quite there yet, but he's certainly starting down that road. And reconciliation with Russia, so uh, with the Soviet Union. So by this time already, by 69 already, the Cold War is kind of simmering down. It was the true demonstration that us in the United States were number one and that we could do anything, you know, that... You know, when President Kennedy in 1961 said, you know, by the end of the century, or by the end of the decade, rather, 
we are going to have somebody on the moon. I mean, then it was, it was a race. It was a competition. And it meant that there isn't anything that we couldn't do. There isn't any problem we couldn't solve. There isn't any place that we couldn't help. It was all about democracy. It was all about competition. It was all about love of country. It, it, was, it was really incredible. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. My memories are pretty vivid of that time because I was going between the second and the third grade, okay? Uh, the summer of 1969, I was eight years old. I didn't become nine years old till uh, December, but I can remember that that summer because there were two huge events that everybody was talking about in 1969. Number one, of course, the landing on the moon, and number two, that they had announced that Chicago was going to get the tallest building in the world, which became the, um, the Sears Tower. So those are the two things I remember the most about 1969. I was uh, 21 years old, and I lived in Urbana, actually. My husband was at work, and I was home taking care of my first baby, who was eight days old, from the hospital. So it was, I think it was 2 o'clock, and he was on a pretty good schedule, so it's feeding time. So we sat on the couch, and I watched this event with my newborn baby, Todd. I had gone to uh, Lima, Peru on a business deal with my dad, and we spent four years down there. We, I could see, and, and the, there was a the parking lot, I could see there, and they were putting up a big, about, about 10.30 or 11, they put up a big screen and, and we said, what in the world's going on? They said, We're going to, they're going to show us the moon landing. So we all stood out, and, and at, at, oh, it's about two, a little bit after two, I think, in the afternoon, stacked full. It just was, couldn't get anybody else in there. I don't know if that was the only place in, in, in Lima. Lima's a big city, and, and so it, it, they have a, a lot of, a lot of people, the public, couldn't see it. After it was all over with, uh, some of the people didn't believe it. They said it was a Hollywood junk, junkie deal. We were watching it on a black and white Sears, uh, Kenmore, uh, not Kenmore, but whatever, Silvertone TV. Um, we were in the living room of our house in Villa Park, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. We had one TV in the house, and I believe every, my entire family was there, me and my three sisters, my mom and dad watching. I was the remote control for the TV because I always sat on the floor right next to the TV because if my fingers touched the uh, antenna leads, it actually improved the picture. And so I was 12 inches away from the, from the screen watching all this. Um, we had three networks at the time, CBS, ABC, and NBC. And those were the only three channels you could watch on. I did talk with my dad just the other day about uh, the Apollo 11 moon landing, July 20th, 1969. Now, I was only nine months old when that happened, so I don't really have any memory of it. But my, my dad tells me that, yeah, they, my, he and my mother did watch it on TV when it happened, and they were just amazed by it. Um, and and uh, I think that they also were very interested in the space program and, and uh, the achievements. I mean, one of the, it, it really is amazing to think you know, here we were, here we were, July 20th, 1969. We did finally put somebody on the moon. Uh, the, the technical achievement that that required is astounding, right? And my parents were always very well-read, learned people and uh, very educated, and I think they appreciated that. So um, I think that, that there might have been a little osmosis there. They instilled some of that onto me as well. Uh, and uh, certainly whenever I would express an interest in, uh, uh, you know, uh, exploration of Mars, when Viking went to Mars in, in 76 and things like that, they were definitely uh, on board with that. I could talk to them about that. So I feel like there was some contagious enthusiasm in, in the household, yeah. <laughs> Let's see, I was 21. So <laughs> it was an eventful year. <laughs> and uh, let's see, that time I was working for Brinks on the south side of Chicago. And um, I, I uh, happened to be home at the time, 
just got a brand new TV color. <laughs> July of 1969, I was 15 years old, and uh, at the the day of the of the landing, I was at a friend's house, and we were all together watching in front of the TV, uh, and uh, it was an incredible, incredible day, incredible event. I remember it perfectly. It was a group of, of friends of mine, uh, as well as their parents and, and relatives, just all gathered at the house eating. It was, a, it was a celebration. It was kind of a nervous celebration during the whole thing. And then it became a really long celebration uh, because we all got there in the early afternoon. And of course, uh, you know, the landing was about, I don't know, three or four o'clock in the afternoon in, in Minnesota. I was, oh gosh, 25 years old at the time. Yeah, and that makes me 74, 75 now. But uh, I was living in Bloomington, Indiana, working for the Bloomington Tribune as a sports writer. At that time, I had a good friend in Indianapolis, Dave. He invited several people over to his apartment for a big cookout and watch the moon landing. Uh, I vividly recall that day just like it was yesterday. But uh, he cooked ribeyes and corn in the husk on the grill. And of course, we had ample beverages too. I think that uh, they didn't come out of, the, uh, out of the unit until about, I don't know, nine or 10 that evening. So we were sitting there all day, you know, for about five or six hours waiting for that event to take place. So, you know, there's a lot of excitement at first and everybody watching the TV. And then after about an hour or two, you'd start splintering off and going doing other things. And then they'd start talking about something on TV and everybody would gather again to try and, you know, is this the moment? Is this the moment? And then it was back, you know, oh, you know, we'll just go do something else. And so it was, a, it was an all afternoon and into the evening affair. Well, I hate to tell you what I remember is that I got so tired of waiting for Neil Armstrong to come out that I went to bed early and I didn't see that first step. But he well, did. Well, I, I saw it. It's, it appeared on a black and white, not perfect television. And uh, I waited up for him to get off, get out. But uh, that was the end of it. I went to bed. <laughs> I was going on my 30s. My kids were young. It was hot outside. I remember that. And my husband at the time was a major in the National Guard, so we were very into what was going to happen with this spaceship. In fact, we collected a bunch of Apollo glasses <laughs> later. But it was, um, it was a thing where you almost cried. It was so, um, it was amazing. My kids, they were little, like three and four and 13, and they even paid attention, which I think my daughter, Dawn probably remembers what happened. And I was just so got up in, in the idea that we had this little old, old fashioned TV sitting on our counter in the kitchen. And I can remember that it was gold. I can remember how that, you know, the screens were weird. I imagine my, you know, because my back was fate turned to them, I can only imagine my dad was in his recliner, my mom was in her easy chair, uh, where my sisters were, who cares, you know. But uh, I, I remember, you know, vividly watching that. And, you know, it was, it was July, it was hot. Uh, air conditioning was a luxury, so it, the big old unit, uh, window unit was cranking, probably cranking in the living room. So I probably cranked the audio way up so we could all hear. But uh, that, was, that was the place. All of the time when that rocket was sitting down on the moon. I kept thinking, don't blow up, don't blow up. Because in the beginning of the 60s, several missiles of Vanguard to be exact, they had blown up right on the space pad. And this was in the back of all of our minds, you know, this can't be happening, you know. Man is walking on the moon and uh, it left an indelible impression on my mind that, you know, if you want something bad enough, do it. No one's stopping you but yourself.
I remember several people said, you know, what are they wasting all this money for? They're not going to walk on the moon. And, uh, of course, that evening, no one from the newspaper was around me, thank heavens. And we all thought it was just great. It was just fabulous. And you could just feel the excitement and the pride in that room. I had seen the disasters before, and I did go through my friends going to Vietnam and some of them not coming back. Um, we had a, and Kennedy, just sit, you were glued for days on the TV. You didn't move. You didn't eat, you didn't do anything. You just watched. And you did the same thing with the moon landing. I was 15 at the time and had been a big fan of the space program ever since the Mercury program. I was five or six when that started. I remember being nervous because of the Apollo, uh, the Apollo 1 disaster and hoping that nothing would happen to this crew. Uh, but it went off flawlessly from Lee's perspective of a 15-year-old watching it on TV at home. I was elated. It, it, it was really glad, glad it happened because I was afraid that something else, something would happen and it, it didn't land. I remember watching them land, the eagle. And, you know, of course you couldn't see it live. You, you could only hear the audience audio live. And I remember being <laughs> really kind of thrilled when they said, the Eagle has landed. Houston, this is Tranquility Base. And that was a moment where they were actually on the moon. And it's like, we did it, we did it. There was a lot of tension, you know, we thought, okay, here comes the space shuttle down and down and down. We all kept thinking, is this really going to happen? Well, it did happen. And afterwards, uh, there was just a sense of pride in everyone that man had accomplished walking on the moon ahead of the Russians. I felt very lucky to have, had, to have my life, of course. And to have this baby that was brand new, wouldn't even remember it, but I remember when they landed, I think I was feeding him and I think he did burp. But it was, you know, I sort of put him here and, and uh, in fact, his dad later on, they had news coverage after it happened and we videoed him in front of the TV when the moon, when they actually landed on the moon. And he was just a, just brand new. When the actual uh, event took place and, and Armstrong gets out of the out of the, the unit of the capsule or and you know touches ground I mean then first it's like dead silence and then I mean just everybody erupted in in in, in joy clapping. Everybody went yay hey, cut their hands. <laughs> Everyone just kind of applauded like that you know and uh, we had another beverage, so to speak, but uh, it was very fantastic. It was just mind-blowing, you know. The very first memory I would have would actually be 1969, the summer of 1969. So I was uh, pretty young, about four years old, but it was such a big deal. Apollo 11 was such a big deal that I certainly remember talking about it, and I remember that evening, my parents pointing up to the sky and looking up at the stars and saying, there's a man out there, there are men out there, isn't this remarkable? And, uh, and then um, the next morning, I recall getting on a bus to go to summer camp and the bus driver asking me, uh, did you see it all? And I was able to say, yes, I saw it all. I mean, it was, it was incredible. I mean, this was, this was a celebration. I remember the TV being real fuzzy, uh, I remember everybody saying, what did he say, what did he say, you know, the, the, the great remarks that were made uh, uh, about the first step, and none of us heard it. We were just all, all yelling, and uh, I probably didn't even understand what it was until the next day reading it in the paper, because it was just that jubilant. I mean, we had been waiting so long to see an event of, you know, some human, and certainly somebody from the United States being the first one to, to walk on the moon. It was, it was just awesome. It was incredible.
What was funny was that the moon landing was, uh, there's only two times in my life that I can remember my mom letting me stay up late. And they're the goofiest times. Number one, for the moon landing, which I fell asleep before we actually got to see it on TV. And number two was when Tiny Tim got married on Johnny Carson. And I think the moon landing, maybe if you put it on a scale, the moon landing would be a little bit bigger than that. After they were done, I remember walking outside with my mom and just looking up and just thinking, wow, we did it. Armstrong is on the moon, Neil Armstrong, Armstrong 38 year old American, standing on the surface of the moon on this July 20th, 1969. I remember watching it, the, the commentators, Walter Cronkite had a, uh, a science advisor sitting with them and they had these models of the Apollo, uh, of the Eagle and the, uh, the Apollo spacecraft that they would show how it was docking and all this other stuff. Certain events were taking place at certain times, but it was on NASA time. It wasn't on, it wasn't on prime time TV, it wasn't TV time. Every night, you know, after dinner, we were herded in front of the television set and we'd watch the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. And the kids would have to be quiet while Cron Cron Cronkite gave the news. And Cronkite was an aviation enthusiast and a space enthusiast. So, uh, and I think I picked up some of his kind of intense excitement about the whole thing as well, for better or for worse. He, uh, he just loved planes and loved to fly and all of that. And the, the space mission was just... Uh, very near and dear to his heart. I do remember the, the awe, and, I, and it was impressive, the awe on the part of uh, teachers and people on television and that, that older generation. And, uh, and it was kind of surprising, you know, like, oh, these old people getting excited about this stuff, you know, but that, 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 there it was. A lot of people, including Walter Cronkite, when he covered this, and we, you, I've seen the footage, I think a shiver went down everybody's spine that, oh wow, it's amazing, we've actually st stepped foot on another celestial body, you know. And uh, it did represent uh, a, a tremendous change uh, in the course of human history. The original moon landing, moonwalk was scheduled to take place, I don't know, like at 11, 30, 12, 1 o'clock at night. And I was going to watch it no matter what. But word came out during the day, and I think cooler, head, cooler heads at NASA prevailed, and all of a sudden word came down that the landing was going to take, the moonwalk was going to take place like at 7.30 at night. I can't imagine anybody not watching that. All of a sudden this, this arm flopped down from the eagle uh, with the television camera on there. It was, and being a video guy, it wasn't really, that wasn't a video guy at the time, but since then, it was a slow scan video uh, camera as opposed to a full a television camera of the day so they could send the signal across quickly. And it was really very, very rudimentary and bad, but still it was amazing. It was from the moon. We were watching this live from the moon. I believed everything that I saw, you know, uh, in the news. If, you know, if Walter Cronkite said it at night, that it must be awesome. And I can remember he was... Uh, he was excited about the space race, which got me and all my friends excited about it as well. So I, um, you know, I, I thought, my gosh, why would we lie about going to the moon? We've been to South, you know, we've been to the South Pole and North Pole. We've been to California. Why can't we go to the moon? You look at those early astronauts. I mean, they're all test pilots. John Glenn, World War II, Korea. Neil Armstrong was a pilot in, in uh, Korea. These are all guys from the military, all usually test pilots from the military. I was very interested in the astronauts. I read all about them. I remember when Alan Shepard went up and the whole thing was exciting to me. And seeing it land was exciting. And I was impressed that not only were they there, but we could see them. You know, I thought that the communication part of it was just amazing. My mom and my three older sisters, um, they were, uh, my sisters at that time were all in high school. So, you know, the Life magazines with all the stories about the astronauts and the good looking guys, the pilots, you know, they really were kind of all full bore of being excited about the, you know, laying on the moon. 
But the Mercury 7s, I could probably name, name them right now. And I could probably name a lot of the Gemini astronauts because they've added like three or four astronauts for the Gemini program. Michael Collins and, and Neil Armstrong were part of the uh, Gemini, Gemini group that came along, uh, Buzz Aldrin. As we got to the Apollo, no, I was getting, that, that, that group became too big, not too big, but came bigger than I can remember. You know, yes, I knew all of the Apollo astronauts prior to the mission. I knew many of the mission commanders on the subsequent Apollo ones because they were uh, either Mercury or uh, Gemini astronauts who got command. If you looked at 1961, 62, 63, when I was much younger, I mean, they were the idols. They, they, were, they were the rock stars of, of any profession to be an astronaut, you know, to be placed in, you know, this can and be exploded up to, to space and not know whether you're going to come back or not. I mean, we just saw those individuals as, as heroes. I mean, we looked up to them. We, we read about them in school. You know, we, we studied them. It, it was, it, they were awesome. The product placement, like, like Tang and a couple other things. I mean, I did pick up on that to have uh, s some of these products that were linked to NASA and the NASA logo was, you know, uh, was really something that, that was kind of exciting. Probably for me, the most exciting thing that came out of the whole landing on the moon was uh, Tang. Um, you know, uh, that's what, I, and every other television commercial said, you know, just like the astronauts. So for me, uh, one of the first things I think about is a moon landing is what we got out of it was before Gatorade, we had Tang. We mixed it up ourselves, you know, we, and so that was kind of, uh, it's crazy, but that's one of the things I do remember. And it's hard to believe that's, you know, we, you know, I don't even know if Tang is still around, but it, it should be. Oh, sure. Yeah. We drank lots of Tang and uh, yeah, yeah, that was, I do remember that. Yeah. I don't think I liked it though. I don't think I was a big fan of it. <laughs> it was potent and yet somehow lacking in flavor, as I recall. You know, it was, it really was, one was hard pressed to find the flavor in Tang, you know, so. <laughs> Anything associated with astronauts and things like that was cool. So Tang was cool. And I don't remember how much, I think, you know, later, maybe not in the 70s, but certainly later, I remember, we, you know, there were things like you could get uh, uh, food packs that they would have so you can eat in zero gravity and things like that. Uh, and, and, you know, just kind of gimmicky things like that. I can remember um, going up to the Museum of Science and Industry to see the moon rocks. And um, the lines were so big that I, I didn't get to go. And then there was a, a small little museum I can't even remember where it was, but it was out east someplace, and they had several of the moon rocks. And I remember looking at them and thinking, you know, it, it just wasn't a, it just wasn't a, an average old rock, but this was a moon rock. It was from the moon. It's just been awesome to think what what's happened in our lives since that has you know taken place. And um, you know, I think I, once if we would kind of say, hey, we're going to go back to the moon, I think I'd get all excited, just like I was when I was you know eight years old. It was part of the, the, the toy culture. Um, we were all, uh, we, were, we all had these uh, like 12 inch GI Joes at that time. And I can remember when I have my friends like Billy Caldwell would come over and he had this space capsule. And I can remember going, uh, you know when you go school shopping with your, your parents? Uh, I can remember going to uh, going school shopping and mom, uh, we couldn't wear jeans to school because that was before the jeans were allowed. But I remember I saw in the Sears catalog, they had this one piece kind of knockoff NASA, you know, uh, kind of space suit. And I thought, I want one of those. And I'm, I mean, I'm, the girls are going to love me, you know, in this thing, because maybe they'll get me confused with like a real astronaut. I had a Ravel Gemini space capsule with, complete with the docking station. They practiced docking, uh, but uh, that I, 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 I painted. I had a Ravel Gemini capsule with a spacewalker, this little bitty plastic string that would hold this astronaut floating outside the capsule. 
Of course, that's the first thing that ever broke on this, you know, and that airplane grew never, never fixed that problem for good. We lived in a tri-level house, and one of the features of that was there was a six-step stairway going from the living room up to the, the second floor. And when I was about five or six or seven, my friend and I, Jim Shout, hey Jim, um, would crawl underneath the stairs and with our crayons, we drew control panels onto the stairs, the, 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 the steps underneath, and would pretend that that was our space capsule. We recently sold my mom's house and I was there doing repairs and other stuff and I looked underneath and it's still there. And uh, I can only hope that some five or six year old crawls underneath the stairs and looks at that and wonders what the heck that is and maybe has their own adventures, because I sure did. For me, I think a lot of my interest in space exploration was coupled with my interest in science fiction. So those two have always sort of run parallel in my life. Uh, and of course, in 1977 is when Star Wars came out, uh, which I, I was eight years old when I saw that and never looked back, you know. I remember reading a, in, in second or third grade about, you know, how the moon was formed. This is right on the verge of understanding galaxies. I can't believe in my lifetime, galaxy, they only thought there was one galaxy. They thought the universe was our galaxy. Now to see these, th these maps of the universe where we're part of a small su supercluster that's just, you know, it's just mind-numbing to think Think of, think of something that large and that you know, huge and that, that sheer number of possibilities. I do feel like, and this was not just with Apollo 11, this was also with Apollo 8 when it circled the moon, uh, that uh, maybe the world was uh, a little bit uh, smaller in some ways. We, had, we were still a little more aware of the larger universe and we were a little more appreciative perhaps of, of the fact that uh, there is a, so much more out there besides uh, what our own little quotidian concerns on this little planet of ours. Um, and uh, uh, when the Apollo 8 astronauts took the, that shot, famous shot of Earth uh, from, you know, from far away and the entire world and everybody who ever you know, lived and you know, the, the all of human experience was encapsulated in that image. My earliest memories go back to the 70s and uh, mostly what was all the rage in those days as I remember and certainly what captivated my imagination was uh, the uh, the unmanned space uh, explorations uh, of the planets and so on, uh, the Mariner missions, the Voyagers, the Pioneers, and so on. And uh, uh, mostly what they, what they were doing, as I recall, in terms of manned missions, were uh, going up to meet Soviets and space stations and things like that. By the late 70s, certainly, I think a lot of the euphoria of, uh, of the Apollo missions and going to the moon and having bases on the moon, uh, a lot of that sort of dissipated, I think. Uh, it's interesting how um, in the 60s, uh, Stanley Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke imagined us having moon bases by 1999. And in the mid-70s, there was a show called Space 1999 that also imagined us having moon, moon bases uh, or a moon base by, space, by uh, 1999. And uh, uh, it turned out not to be the case. So. <laughs> To me, space exploration is, is really, really awesome. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a cool thing. It's that, it's that last frontier, if you will. Uh, and there, there's just so many different technologies and innovations that have come from the this, this space uh, uh, program that I can only imagine what other things would happen by continuing space uh, exploration and so on. It, to, to me, it's really cool. I mean, it's extremely expensive, hugely expensive. And uh, for many, it might be, we, maybe we should concentrate on some other major concerns in the world today. But uh, I, find, I find space exploration to be incredibly interesting. I think a goal for us to go to Mars, can we do it? I think we can. Um, it sounds crazy because um, there's almost kind of a, a, a commercial aspect to uh, space exploration. You know, if you have enough money, you can go, you know. Um, it's not just the Russians and the Americans, you know, you have a very, um, 
you know, the French and the, the Japanese, uh, we have this amazing knowledge wealth of that, that's out there for us. There are all kinds of experiments that, that they're doing at NASA, at ESA, and other places uh, that are looking at the astronomical properties and astrophysical properties and quantum physics and so on. And uh, I think we really are on a, on a frontier, a fresh frontier here. You know, I would like for us to go back to the moon. I think it's worth the expense because what are we going to learn? You know? Um, you know, I love to hear about you know, the, the satellites that go off that are taking these phenomenal cameras with them and we're getting to see the far reaches of our universe. And um, there's a part of me that's always saying that's not real, but there's a part of me that says that is real and it's amazing and it makes me feel how small a person I am in this galaxy. No one knows what's going to happen in the future. But uh, I won't be surprised at anything that NASA does in the coming years. When I was young, it was getting to the moon, you know. Now as uh, people who are now 14 and 15, you know, getting to Mars, I mean, it's, it's, it's just a goal. And when you set a goal and you can accomplish something so incredible, I mean, so almost unthinkable, you know, that it, it just it just feels that 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 human desire to grow and to develop uh, and to reach greater heights and I, I just think it's wonderful. In my wife my my mother's lifetime, she was alive about the time the Wright brothers flew. And in her lifetime, they went from horseback to the moon. In my lifetime, we've gone to the moon, and of course we have the internet, and we have computers at blazing speeds, and artificial intelligence, and all these wonderful marvels of technology. But the fact we've never been back to the moon really disappoints me as a society, as a human race. Because the moon is more than just a rock in space. It's our partner in this trip. It is our, it's our step to the next level, you know, Yes, Mar going to Mars will be difficult. If it wasn't difficult, we would have been done years ago. Yes, getting out of this solar system will be darn near impossible. But we need, we will do it someday. Hopefully, we will do it someday because exploring is in our nature. We need to have that next step, to have that next adventure, to see what's out there, to find what's out there. There are so many ways in which the Apollo 11 landing uh, is significant in the history of human nature, in the history of, of humankind. And I think that uh, 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 as time passes, when we celebrate the 100th anniversary, the 200th anniversary, we're going to recognize that as one of the highlights of human history. We're going to add that to any number of other moments, the, the, the invention of the printing press by Gutenberg and other things that represent tremendous uh, milestones and tremendous watershed events that have great significance for the human species in the long term. Oh, I look back on it now and I think 50 years, you know? And I remember, you know, now asking myself, did it really happen, you know? And of course, as I mentioned earlier, uh, people said, oh, it never happened. It was, on, you know, nothing but a production in Hollywood. And I keep thinking, yeah, go ahead and say that. But I was there, and I remember it vividly. And I remember when they stepped on the moon, it was the most, there I was with my little baby, burping, loving that baby. And the, when they stepped down off of that spaceship, I actually saw dust around. I assumed it was dust. And so I thought, wow. We actually did this, and I felt we did this as a whole because we were a country that was united. I felt we all were united. After the mission on the moon and after they blasted off, everything seemed to just, it couldn't have gone any smoother. As a matter of fact, I think they landed within sight of the pickup ship, which was amazing because we had live video of this, of, of the parachutes opening and them landing. And, and of course, then they were quarantined for 
a couple of days because just in case they picked up a moon germ, uh, you know, <laughs> which in hindsight looks sounds really stupid, but you know, uh, they weren't taking any chances. I certainly remember uh, a couple of teachers who were just awestruck by this stuff, uh, and and that would be the term, awestruck. Uh, dazzled by it. And again, back to that 42 years between Lindbergh and the uh, landing on the moon. Uh, so these would have been people who grew up in a, compl a completely different way with this type of talk. A man on the moon would just seem insane. I mean, you know, one of my earliest memories was a man on the moon. So to me, it seemed, I wouldn't say natural, but sort of, you know, not anything that was all that incredibly shocking. And here, not only was there a man on the moon, but you could see it on television, broadcast, whatever it was, uh, 240,000 miles back to, back to Earth. When I got into school, um, I, uh, I remember a teacher, I think is, I can't remember what his name, Mr. Kickinap. And he goes, do you know, boys, how they got to the moon? And we're going, how? And he says, math. Math is how they got to the moon, which scared me because I hated math, you know. But at that point, we thought, okay, maybe there is a value to learning math. So I tried to be a better student, and I committed myself to raising my grade from a D to a C. When Neil Armstrong did that, he hopped onto the base, and then he stepped onto the moon, saying his line, uh, you know, we were, we were all... You know, everybody was paying attention to what he said. You know, and of course, whether or not he misspoke or not, I still think it was cool that making the universality of a small step for man was just a really cool way of including everybody in the world. We all know that in 1986, the space channel, the space shuttle Challenger exploded, and um, I almost witnessed it live. So uh, I, I was living in, I was going to Rutherford High School in Rutherford, New Jersey, at the time. I got home that afternoon, early afternoon or late morning, whenever it was. My dad was watching the coverage and uh, I just missed it, I think by about five minutes, it was, it had just happened. We were not sure what was going on at first, but it looked like it had exploded and, and there was a lot of uncertainty and of course as time passed and it all sunk in that this was a terrible tragedy that my generation had never witnessed before in the space age. And it was just sort of a reminder of, of uh, how hard this is and, and and how challenging it is. Um, that event really um, stands out for me because of my own personal experience of it as, as a reminder of why it's important to keep moving forward and not be daunted and, uh, and yet at the same time be aware that, yeah, it's, it's not an easy road. Uh, it's a tough road, but it's, a, but it's an important road that we're on and we need to stay on it and keep moving forward. I mean, who, who of us doesn't go out and look at the moon at night. And we're going, oh, it's, you know, it's a half moon, it's a quarter moon, it's, it, it's a full moon. We're still mesmerized by the nature of the moon itself. And all the stories growing up of the man and the moon and all the you know, good night moon and, and, and everything else. I mean, that, that is a part of our being, you know, being from the planet Earth, you know, this moon. And so to actually have somebody come from here go up there, who knows how they do it, walk there, put a flag in place, you know, kind of the patriotic thing, and then come back here, splash down, and then, you know, two days later, waving to the public. After, you tell me what kind of uh, other events have taken place uh, in my lifetime that has such a monumental and one-time moment. It's not something that took place, if you will, you know, this event over the course of of tens and 20 and 30 years, it might have built up to that, but this was one day, one time, and it was spectacular. Sometimes, as a historian, I sort of think about how, how this moment will be remembered and how, what is the impact in the long term, and I think it, it had a tremendous impact right then and there. I think as we sort of look back on it in the long term, I feel like we are recognizing just how important a moment that was. It was the culmination of unprecedented human achievement in not only in terms of engineering, but in every imaginable way. The thousands of years, uh, the million years in which man stood down here on his small planet and uh, thought and wrote and dreamed about the moon. I know nothing about how a computer works. I know, no I know nothing about how a car operates. But I, l I look at it and I think they're just absolute marvels. And I just think that 
We need to be continually developing our society and our, 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 our students and just everybody to kind of um, see what we can pull out of science. I don't think we could have done that without a lot of prayer and that was amazing. It was just like they did it. I mean, you were like shocked. It wasn't like watching Kennedy thing where you sit for days. You just, wow. It was a wow thing. I think people will remember it. Uh, maybe not the details. I don't remember the details. But I know that it was done. And it was the beginning. Well, I mean, if you can have people known for the first <coughs> airplane flight across the Atlantic, you should be able to remember this, too. And I'm sorry I didn't stay up for it, because I do think <laughs> it has more significance than I realized. They're discovering planets around stars every day. And around one of those stars, someplace, there could be somebody sitting there interviewing about the 50 years since their moon landing. I want to talk to that person. It sort of showed us what we're capable of. It showed us what, what humans can do. Uh, because there was a lot of, uh, it, very little happens in science in a straight line. There's a lot of uh, zigzagging, a lot of experimentation, and a lot of sacrifice. And sacrifice especially uh, marked the progress that we made in the space program. My dad, of course, uh, he was quite, he was a veteran. So he was quite proud of the space shuttle. Uh, my mother just was absolutely enthralled with it because she knew that if we can put, her thoughts were, and mine also, if we can put a man on the moon, our possibilities are limitless in this nation where we live, in this world where we live. And I, she, they brought me up to believe that anything actually can be accomplished if you work hard enough, if you dream big enough, and if you do it. And that's been my philosophy my entire life. Now, I would have wished that we had gone to the moon 10 more times, just that it was that cool. But uh, it's hard to believe we were only there three times. And when I look back at my 50 years, you know, since the, uh, the land on the moon, we've come a long way and we have a lot of opportunities out there ahead of us. We just have to say, uh, let's do it and we can. All you gotta do is go back to say H. T. Wells, Jules Verne. They were way ahead of their time. There is no such word as can't, as far as I'm concerned. So I knew that we're gonna get there.